Hello and welcome to this short vidcast. My name is Rona Sharp and I'm recording this vidcast on lecturing for you today as part of the First Steps into Teaching MOOC which OCSLD is running for the first time in May 2012. I've started with a photograph of a lecture theatre. The lecture theatre in this photo probably seats, I don't know, 200 odd students but it doesn't take this many students sitting in front of you neatly in rows before I think you find yourself starting to lecture. I think you can find with as few as 30 odd students in a room with tiered seating like this photograph that students start to take on the role of sitting quite passively perhaps listening taking notes and before you know it you find yourself lecturing. I'm looking at these students I'm looking at this photo and I'm imagining how it feels at the front of the room. I know it's going to be quite hard to know what's going on inside the students' heads and how well they're concentrating. It's difficult for us to put ourselves into their shoes. And I remember that although I might be lecturing for four or five hours each week, students could be sat in this kind of environment for four or five hours each day. I know what's going on in my head. I walk into a room like this. I'm looking for windows. I'm wondering about the trade-off of opening them for air but letting noise in. I know personally my voice is quite strong but I'm wondering if it's going to be difficult for the students right at the back of this room to hear me if I open those windows. I'm thinking that I'd like to ask some questions but if I do will I get a response? Will the students find it hard to speak up in this kind of environment and even if they do speak up are they going to be audible? And I'm wondering, how well is this lecture preparing them for the out-of-class activity that I want them to do, for their own independent study? How good's their note-taking? And what on earth are they doing on their mobile phones? I'm really aware of competing against distractions. There seemed to be this thing going on on Flickr for a number of, <laughs> of months, I don't know why, where people emptied their bags and took photographs of them. And this was a student emptying their bag, thinking about what they took to lectures. I know I'm competing against this kind of stuff, against students accessing information from multiple online sources, probably while I'm talking. I can't ignore the technology that they're using and there's lots of studies you'll find in the notes which show that students use laptops in class, spend considerable time multitasking and actually these are a significant distraction to both the person who's using them and the fellow students around them. So these are the kind of things that I'm thinking about and the questions that I have as I'm walking into a lecture theatre. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to pause the video now and spend a couple of minutes writing down the questions that you have about lecturing, the things that you're thinking as you're walking into a lecture theatre or that you'd like to get out of watching this short vidcast. So welcome back. I've tried to anticipate here some of the questions that, that you might ask. They're quite broad to encompass, I hope, many of, of your questions, but they really come down to why do we do it? What's the role of the lecture in, the, in today, the information age? How do we do it well? So how do we do it in ways that capture and maintain students' attention? And what difference does it make? How can the lecture contribute to student learning? And that's what I'm going to go through in this short vidcast now, those three questions. So why do we lecture? What's the role of the lecture today? Well, you can find numerous pictures like this, but I'm sorry, I think the main reason that we lecture is tradition. Originally, lectures were there to share the content of books. Now, quite clearly, we don't need to do this anymore. We've come a long way since the only person who had the book was the person in the front of the class. There are many, many other ways now of sharing the content of books. In fact, what we've got is a dependence on electronic sources that we all know about. I'll show you a couple of quotes now that come from students who were keeping audio di diaries in 2005, 2006 about the ways that they used technology and this was one of the first studies on learners' experiences of, of e-learning. The first thing I do when given any piece of work is I type it into a search engine. Fair enough, all agree with that? This one worries me more. You type in one word and you get all, my emphasis, all the information that's out there on it without even having to look through different books. 
Gronia Canol and her colleagues who conducted this learning experience of e-learning study found even back then Google and Wikipedia were students preferred information retrieval tools and they were the preferred tools largely because students saw university library resources as much harder to access and much more difficult to search they didn't really have the skills to do it and we now know that students are quite poor in their information search and evaluation skills. This is another study which was conducted a little bit later uh, by University College London, uh, which has been referred to commonly as the Google Generation study, which found that even though the Google Generation, youngsters born or brought up in the internet age, demonstrate an apparent ease and familiarity with computers, they rely heavily on search engines. They view rather than read documents and they don't possess critical and analytical skills that are necessary to actually assess the information that they find on the web. So this lack of information skills is a, is a particular problem as subject knowledge increases. Uh, we know that all disciplines rest on a knowledge base but as time goes on we're finding that there is a huge increase in the amount of fact, information, stuff that is available across most all disciplines really. There's a lot to know, there's a lot for students to get to grips with. So what we had was um, a situation where there was a limited amount of knowledge in any particular field and the person at the front of the room was the person in possession of that knowledge, probably because they had the book and they were sharing the content and the content of the book with the people sat in rows in front of them. We've moved on a long, a long way since then. So why do we lecture now? I'll just give you a chance to read these quotes from uh, two of our most well-known educationalists. And I guess the point I'm making here is that it's not just about content. We have this content conundrum that we want students to uh, acquire knowledge, that, that factual knowledge, lower level, things that are lower in Bloom's hierarchy, if you like, are important, are required, but they're important because we want students to do things with them, whether it's application, analysis, synthesis, evaluation, those are the, the things that we want them to do. So there's a lot of information out there. Students need to acquire some of it in order to be able to achieve the higher level objectives that we're aiming for in higher education. But how do we uh, uh, get them to acquire that knowledge, transfer that content, if you like, um, without boring them? This is important. These are some, um, you know, just quotes from talking to lecturers in different disciplines. And I often hear these kinds of comments and I hear these kinds of comments linked to a frustration, if you like, that students can't see the connection between content and application of that content. The most obvious one, you know, well, without calculus, there's no engineering, really. You need the calculus in order to be able to do the engineering. So how do we help students with all of this content? Are lectures the answer? Are lectures the primary teaching and learning method? that we should be using to help students get to grip with all this content. How can we as teachers help students to learn this? Well, traditionally, we lecture. If you haven't come across it already, I strongly recommend you, you read Bly's What's the Use of Lectures, which is a, a literature review, a synthesis of the available literature meta-analysis, looking at the effectiveness of, of lectures. And the overall conclusion is that lectures are as good as, but no better than, other methods for conveying facts. And some of the other methods are lifted there. So we don't lecture because it's the most effective method. There's no evidence that it's the most effective method. So that's not why we do it. And what I want to do is just present uh, some of the problems that I think are there about why we use lectures to help students to learn content. What, what are the problems with using lectures as the primary teaching and learning method to learn content? The first problem, I think, the first problem with lectures is that students need to know what it is you want them to learn. I don't know the source of this quote. I, I think it's just one of these ones that is anonymous. 
But what students often want to get out of lectures more than anything else is a good set of notes. Um, they want to know what it is they're supposed to learn and they need the notes to support their study and the assignments they tackle. In fact, there's been some lovely stuff um, uh, looking at students' attitudes towards lecture notes, which suggests that they treat them with the respect of a kind of talisman. As long as I own the notes, as long as I can hold them, then, then they will be good for me. Bly's book that I showed on the previous slide has a very good chapter on note taking, which shows that students are quite poor at note taking, either if you're looking at selecting, did they note down the important points? So what the lecturers think were the important points, did the students note those down? Looking at students' accuracy in their note taking, look at the uh, sheer amount, number of important points that they got out of a lecture. And there's all sorts of problems there with note taking. So we really need to help students know what it is that we want them to learn. Having said that, there are also studies that show a positive link between note taking and memory. So the students who have taken notes have better recall for that, uh, that information than the students who didn't. In order to learn content from lectures, students need to be able to summarise, paraphrase, make meaning from new information coming in and integrate it with what they know already. Now I'm going to say that again because I suspect you probably weren't listening to me. You were trying to read the difficult information that I posted up on that slide there. And it's incredibly difficult for students to do two things at once, particularly when we're asking them to do more than just write down what the lecturer is saying. I'll say it again. In order to learn content from lectures, students need to be able to summarise. They need to be able to paraphrase to make meaning, their own meaning, from the new information that's coming in. They need to be able to integrate the new information that's coming in with what they know already. This is hard learning, especially when there's no pause button and no rewind button on a live lecture. When new information is coming in through multiple channels, you're listening to me, you're trying to read my slides, we know that students often revert to an emergency fallback position of trying to record and capture what is being said in order to learn it later. That's a problem. If we're saying we're lecturing because it's a way of transferring content, it's a poor way of transferring content because the students aren't very good at getting the information down. The second problem, I'm gonna argue, with lectures is that there's an enormous amount of content already available online. Why should students, when students can access lectures from experts in the field around the globe at a time and a place that's convenient to them, why do they need to come to our lectures? How do we help students make good choices about what to attend and about how to use this kind of additional content that's available on iTunes and other repositories? We know that attendance at lectures is, what should we say, um, variable. There's uh, Donald Clark in his keynote to the Alt-C, the Association for Learning Technology Conference in, in 2010, and, and it's all on YouTube, you can go and have a look at it, shows uh, the results from a project that was undertaken with five Russell Group universities measuring attendance, which shows that attendance falls uh, over the first five weeks of a course and then remains at about 50% for the rest of the semester. So how can we claim that lectures are the best place to transfer content when half the audience isn't even there? My third problem with lectures, and some of you of my age group may uh, remember this clip from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, again it's, it's available on YouTube, is that it's difficult for students to maintain attention in lectures. How long do you think people can uh, maintain their attention for in lectures? I've got a little graph here. What do you think? Um, level of performance. This is a, a graph taken from Gibbs's lecturing to more students and the level of performance is an amalgam of all sorts of things from physiological responses to recall at that part of, of the session. Um, how long are people maintaining attention for? Well, it's about 15 minutes or thereabouts. 
While teachers are lecturing, students are not attending to what is being said for about 40% of the time. And this has been shown in, in numerous studies. We've got an attention span in passive tasks. I'm talking about passive, sitting, listening, note taking, reading, all passive tasks of about 15 minutes before attention starts to wane. And it falls off dramatically, depressingly, perhaps. The good news is it's fairly easy to get back. So if you're looking at restoring performance, it can be done. You can see that attention goes back almost to the same level that it was at the beginning, although it's not maintained for quite as long. And if you are doing a, a didactic presentational lecture, you may find actually that you need to introduce more than one break in order to maintain attention across most of the time. Attention also uh, is not maintained for as long each time. Now, I really am talking about passive tasks here. Now, obviously, if you're actively involved in a task, attention is completely different, whether you're an air traffic controller or in the last revision session of the semester. Um, level of performance, apart from the little blip at the beginning there, so remains pretty constant when students are actively engaged. Now this is important because there's such a strong link between attention and memory. So what we're trying to do obviously is trying to increase attention by taking breaks, we're trying to encourage active engagement during the session with activities, and we're trying to encourage rehearsal of material soon after the session as well. And quite clearly that's because if there's no active engagement with material during the lecture or in the 24 hours after the lecture, then recall is very, very poor. However, if you can get students to engage during or immediately after the lecture and the information is used actively, then uh, recall of that information is maintained. So clearly, we've moved uh, a long way from the original purpose of the lecture to share the content of a few books. We've moved from a time even when the lecture was a way of giving access to the knowledge of, of the lecturer because they, they can get access in lots of other ways. But we know attendance is poor, attention is poor, remembering is poor, access to other content is free and easy. So remind me again, why do we lecture? Okay, so this is just a, a summary of some of the things that I've already said. These quotes are taken from um, the Frank Ketteridge Handbook for Teaching and Learning, which has a, a nice little section on why do we lecture? Or perhaps, why should we still be lecturing in the information age? I've shown three problems with lecturing, and I hope I've shown, and I hope it's, you're fairly easily convinced that we shouldn't be lecturing for transfer of content. So what alternative reasons are there for lecturing? Uh, these are better reasons. I like these reasons. We might be lecturing to share new knowledge that isn't ready available in other formats. We might be lecturing to demonstrate some academic or professional skills, whether that's how to integrate new topics, compare things, um, share frameworks for thinking. Frequently we lecture to give an overview. One lecturer said to me, uh, not taken from the book, and I, I thought this was a really interesting conversation, that they use lectures only to cover the hard things, the hardest things, the things that the students could not learn through reading about. And this lecturer said she trained her students very early on not to uh, expect to be able to substitute lectures and reading, that they were not interchangeable. And that's actually quite an important thing for the students to know why we're lecturing and what we expect them to do. And actually in doing this she found that the hardest challenge was finding and recommending readable texts for pre-reading. You know designing and preparing interactive lectures was fine but trying to find things which she was happy would be good pre-reading was something that she spent an awful lot of time on. So finally then I'm going to give you um, some uh, some suggestions for lecture alternatives that you can go away and look up and think about. I, I guess I would, I would encourage you to do two things. I would encourage you to write down very carefully your own reason for lecturing. And I don't mean this in a broad, all-encompassing way. I mean, for each topic, 
which aspect of it would be best taught in a lecture and which aspect of it would be best taught in other ways. And then I would also encourage you to look at alternative ways that lectures can be organised and structured. So there are three examples here and, and they're in the notes for this session. So the first one there is uh, Monica Rankin from the University of Texas who, who you may have already seen and you can uh, Google her uh, and on the Twitter experiment and she's looked at the role of Twitter in teaching history in an American university, uh, the University of Texas. That's a very interesting, completely different example, way of organising lectures. Uh, the guy at the bottom there is Eric Mazur. He's from Harvard University and he's a physics teacher. And you can find him by Googling confessions of a converted lecturer. And you'll find many uh, examples of him on YouTube teaching through what he calls um, peer instruction, which is basically the students working together on questions that he has preset. And he tells a, a very um, enticing narrative about how he switched from a traditional lecture format to a style of teaching totally based on questions and answers. And then the, the one on the right there, you can just see a student holding a, a clicker or a personal response system. And this is an example from engineering at the University of Strathclyde and also languages at the same university, talking about how they've used the peer response system, the clickers, to encourage student engagement in lectures. So there are three examples there. I'm sure you can find others and it might be really useful for you to share other examples as part of this MOOC of lecture alternatives and think about how well they fit the reasons that you have for lecturing.